Father, you are great. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Father, we don't deserve your grace. We cannot earn your mercy. And so for this reason, tonight we praise you. We exalt your name, Lord. For you are Lord of all. And so open our heart and our mind, Lord, as Jacob teaches. And I pray that you will make us respond and help us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys may take a seat. Give it up for the band. They are incredible. I love, I, I could listen to them lead us in worship every day of my life. Every day of my life. And now my forehead matches Jordan's shirt today, so that's perfect. Spend some time in the sun without sunscreen and it'll pay. Y'all doing good today? Are we a little tired? Yeah? What book of the Bible are we in today? Acts. Yeah. What chapter? No? 16 is close. 14, you're going the wrong direction. Too far? 17, right there in the middle. 17. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. It's been a really good day, AC students. We have had pretty good weather. We by now have all been tugged on a jet ski or had to tug somebody on a jet ski. And I think at the end of the day, we are done with the jet skis. In fact, I think they're in the trash can. Like, we're done with the jet skis. Amen. Amen. Look, part of land wreck is just to make you tired enough so that you can sleep on, on just thin little beds. You know what I'm saying? That's part of camp. That's part of camp. It has been a really good day, and I'm really looking forward to tonight. But I, I'll be honest with you, students. I, I'll be honest. This passage is hard to teach. To be honest, this passage could probably be three or four sermons. I could probably take us to nine o'clock and preach for an hour and a half. But you guys can't handle that. You ain't ready for that. You ain't ready for that. And, and so... For that reason, it's tough. There's a lot. There's a lot to be said in Acts 17. The, the other reason that this passage is really tough is because if we actually believe that this is God's word for us, then my life must change. If, if these words are true, your life must change. This passage is not for little children. It's time for you students, even if you're still 11 years old, put your big boy hat on. All right, this, this passage is really good and ought to challenge us. Before I get to verse 16, that's where we're going to pick up. Before I get to verse, verse 16, let's just carry through where Pastor Clint left off in chapter 9 yesterday. What happened in chapter 9 yesterday? Saul was converted. All right, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me, Right? Saul is then brought in by Barnabas. Well, at first Ananias, but then Barnabas kind of brings Saul slash Paul, we'll call him Paul now, along his missionary journey. In chapter 15, something really significant happens. Does anybody know what happens in Acts 15? This is significant for you. Like Acts 15 is you. Yeah, it's called the Jerusalem Council. If you look at the subheading, what happens at the Jerusalem Council? Yeah, very good. Okay, one person remembers Acts 15. Yeah, good job, Olivia. 10 points, Gryffindor. All right, in Acts 15, the Jerusalem council, they meet because they have been hearing that Gentiles are believing in Jesus and receiving the Holy Spirit. And the ethnic Jews are like, yo, what's up with that? And that is when it is decided that yet yeah, Gentiles can be brought into the family of God alongside of the ethnic Jews. Gentiles being you, as in you are most likely not an ethnic Jew. And so Acts 15 is, is relevant to us because I can have salvation. You could be in God's family because of Acts 15 and what God did there through the early church. In Acts 16, you guys covered it in family groups some today. We meet, there's kind of two really cool stories. There's a story of Lydia, a very popular story, right? She, she is converted and then wants to be baptized immediately. Then there's the Philippian jailer, really good children's book about singing songs to God when times are tough. Uh, it's part of that God's Big Idea series. Just write that down, and in 10, 15 years, when you got kids, read it to your four-year-old. They'll love it. It's a good, good book, good book. And we find ourselves in Acts 17. Now, I got a lot to read, okay? I, I got a lot to read today. And so I'm going to read and then have some kind of 
running commentary. So I might read a word and then pause and say a couple things and then just jump back into it, okay? So just, just look at your Bible and w- walk through it with me. Here we go. Verse 16, chapter 17. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, you, you've heard of Athens, the, the Greek like empire, kind of an elitist town. You've heard of maybe the Parthenon. You're familiar with Percy Jackson books. Remember, those are false gods. They're not real but they're helpful for you to understand what was the culture of Athens like. If Vegas is sin city, Athens was heresy city. They had thousands and thousands of idols to false gods, Athens. His spirit, while he was in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So Paul reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Who's the famous philosopher you guys have heard of? Socrates, Socrates, Aristotle, Aristotle, Plato. Those guys are in Athens, right? Also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Verse 19, they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. It's kind of like just think like town square where everyone gets together and talk and hear each other's ideas. May we now, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring, bro, you bring some strange things to our ears. And we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, guys, I want to preach like Paul. He says so much with just few words. It's amazing. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. He's not necessarily saying that you believe in the same God that I believe in, but you obviously have a lot of religion going on in your town. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, to the unknown God of all their thousands of idols, and you even know the, some of the names of them, the Zeus and Athena and Poseidon, like those kinds, and more, for all of those gods, that they, they had thousands of these idols, and yet, in fear of leaving one off, which they did, in fear of leaving one off, they made an inscription to the unknown God, and Paul saw the opportunity and seized it. This is what he says. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, The God, notice it's a capital G now, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since, turn the page, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he, God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet, he's actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And look, he actually even uses, he uses their words, their own poets here. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Just a few more verses. Hang with me here. Verse 29. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Guys, you want big boy pants right here? Verse 31 and 30. 30 and 31. Obviously, we go in chronological order. Verse 30 and 31. These are, these are big boy verses. These are big girl verses. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Those are big verses. Let's pray. Ask for the Lord's help. God, you are the the God of Abraham, uh, of Isaac, of Jacob, of Paul. You are the God of everything and every one of us. Lord, I'm asking for your help now that you would illuminate this word in these students' hearts that they may have life in your name, that they would not worship what is unknown, but that they would know you 
in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you look at the, if you look at the subheading at verse 16, what does yours say? Paul in Athens? You know, the, the, whenever you're a preacher, you want to like get a nice title so that your tech team can put it on YouTube for all your families to watch later. And I was like, what's a, what's a good title for this? What summarizes this passage really well? I don't need to overcomplicate it. It's actually pretty given to us, pretty much given to us. But we're at Camp Paradise. Our camp theme is witnesses. So why don't we tie that in? Instead of Paul and Athens, how about we look at us? How about we look at witnesses and the world? How about we look at witnesses and the world today? I, I got four things for us. Four things. We'll move fairly quickly. And then we will kind of camp out. We'll, we'll move quickly through the first three and kind of camp out in, in the fourth one. So here's number one. You ready for this? If you're taking notes, write this down. Witnesses, witnesses. If we're going to live in the world, witnesses. We need to be bothered by the lost. Witnesses are bothered by the lost. If we want to walk out of this camp and be, be witnesses for God with the power of the Holy Spirit to, to make great the name of Jesus in Charlotte, North Carolina, America, and to the ends of the earth. That's my one act, Acts 1-8, Charlotte 2022 uh, rendition right there. But if we are going to be that, then we need to be bothered by the lost. Honestly, I get this with just one, one word, and it's a strong word. You see it in verse 16. Look at it. Look at verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit, his soul was, say it with me, provoked, provoked. The, as he looks around at the city that is not worshiping God, his soul, his spirit is provoked. What, what kind of emotion is that, must it be? What was it, a, an, an emotion of anguish? Just like so exasperated, frustrated, like just grit your teeth, like, oh my goodness, they've missed it. Was it anger? Like, what in the world are you guys doing worshiping all these dumb idols? These aren't even real. Or was it sorrow? Was it pity? Was Paul walking through the streets, weeping over the lostness around him? Paul was provoked in his spirit as he walked around Athens. Witnesses are to be provoked and bothered by the lostness around them. Does anybody know the general idea of the population of Charlotte, Metro Charlotte? Just kind of a general. What is it? Someone shout out a number. 3.4? Is it 3.4 million now? Oh. Yeah, it's like 2.5 million. It's closer to that, 2.7 million. 3.4 be quite a lot. It depends on what, it depends if you add like Gastonia in there, that kind of affects it. But let's just, let's just go with 2.5 million. That, that's roughly where our city is. 2.5 million people in the city of Charlotte. 48% of our city goes to church. That's just who goes to church. That's not even those who are actually saved, who are actually born again believers. So what if that number was really 40%? Well, let's just stick with 48 because it's closer to 50 because I, then I can say this. That means that one out of two people you come in contact with are lost, will die and go to hell. One out of two people in your class, every other house you drive by in your neighborhood, every other person at the checkout aisle at the grocery store, half of your soccer teammates will die without Jesus in your city and spend eternity away from God. One out of two. One out of two in this room, one out of two. 48%. That's just who goes to church. Students, are you, are you bothered by the lostness around us? Are you bothered by the fact that our city, Charlotte, has two of the rapid, rap, most rapid growing population or people groups. One, guys, we have refugees and immigrants moving to our city in the fifth fastest pace in all of America. Our city is rapidly growing to not be American, but to be immigrants moved into our city, moving from places in, in Southeast Asia, other parts of Asia and in South America, coming worshiping thousands of gods and Hinduism, but being people of, of Muslim re religion, dying with, without God going to hell. Or the, the other is the rise of the nuns. Do y'all know what the rise of the nuns is? Rise of the nuns, that's like, like people my age and younger-ish, the, the millennials and younger. So anybody, let's just go 40 and younger, 40 and younger. The rise of the nuns. We are a transplant city. What this means, what Charlotte means for this is that people from like New York and, and Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., those three primarily about my age, your age, are moving to Charlotte 
and they are the first generation that has like more than 20% have no religious affiliation. Rise of the nuns, the non-religion, non-religious. No religious affiliation. For those things, guys, our city, our city looks a lot like Athens. Charlotte in the 21st century looks a lot like Athens in the first century. Guys, are you, are you bothered by the fact that your teammates, your classmates, your neighbors will die if they don't hear the gospel and then go to hell away from God? Does that bother? Are you provoked by the lostness? Are you provoked by, by the people who will chase other things for pleasure and happiness, missing the point altogether that Jesus has come to make them whole? Are you bothered that even in your own life there's lostness? Are, are, students, are, are you bothered with the, with the small pockets of lostness in your own heart? And there's, a, there's a pastor that I really appreciate some of his work. His name is Jeff Vanderstelt. I like to call him Jeffy Jeff, okay? Jeffy Jeff, he wrote this book called Gospel Fluency. And the first line in the book is this, everyone is an unbeliever. Everyone is an unbeliever. Uh, whoa, whoa, Jeffy Jeff, I believe in Jesus. Why are you calling me an unbeliever? His argument is that when you sin, that's a moment of unbelief. When you sin, when you, when you exercise pride, you're not believing that God is on the throne. When you, when you chase that image for pleasure, you're not believing that God provides all the pleasure we need. You, that's a moment of unbelief. Everyone is unbeliever. Are you bothered by the own unbelief in your own heart? Student, do you, do you grieve over your sin? When you do wrong and the guilt you feel, does that drive you to just be better next time so people will forget what you did three years ago? Or does it drive you to the Lord in repentance? Do you confess your sin and, and seek his grace? Because ultimately, look at, look at back at verse 16. Ultimately, what was Paul bothered by? What was he provoked about? His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of, say it, idols. He is provoked. He is bothered by the fact that God is not getting the glory that he deserves. Students, are you bothered by, in your own life or your friend's life, in our city's life, are you bothered by the fact that God is not getting the glory that his great, we sing how great that art, are you bothered that people aren't singing that with you? Are you bothered that God is not getting the glory he deserves? But that, that's not the only thing. That's not the only thing that the witnesses in the, in the world, that like us, ought to be cognizant of. Look with me down to verse 17. Verse 17. So Paul, he reasoned three places and three people. You ready? He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and devout persons. That's one. And in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. That's two. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. There's three. Paul was engaging with those around him. So here's point number two. Witnesses engage the lost. Engage. Interact with. Not seclude from. Not run away from. Witnesses engage the lost. Actually, there's, there's a good indicator of what that engagement looks like. You see that third word in verse 17? You see it? He reasoned in the synagogue. And then that, that right after the comma, there's that word and. So you could use the word reason again, and reasoned in the marketplace every day. And then look at verse 18. It's a different word this time. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed. What was Paul doing? He opened his mouth and he preached the gospel. He wasn't just trying to be a good person for them and be like, ah, oh, maybe he's a Christian. No, Paul told them he was a Christian. And then he told them how they could be a Christian and why God is worthy of their lives. He reasoned and he conversed. He opened his mouth and he engaged the lost. He engaged with them. I love the way that this is uh, set up for us in verse 17. He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons. You guys know that Paul did this. He did this all the time. He would go in pretty much every day that he could and, and, and argue that Jesus was the Messiah for those Jews there. Guys, I got to pick up the pace. Goodness. When was the last time? This was a place of worship. These were, these were formerly his people. And I think it's just interesting as we sit at camp, at a Christian camp with all of our student ministry, when was the last time we even considered sharing the gospel with our own student ministry? Uh, you koinonia 2.0 students, when was the last time you shared the gospel with with that middle school student in your D group. College student, when was the last time you shared the, the gospel with that, that high schooler in your family group? 
It's interesting. Paul sets an example here that there are people in our places of worship that do not know Jesus, and we must share the gospel with them too. Let us not neglect that. What if the culture of Hickory Grove students was not that the leaders had to be the one evangelizing everybody, that the, the pressure didn't just rest with the preacher each night, but that it was on you guys to share the gospel with each other, that you would see your own friends come to faith? It's interesting. Paul sets that example up for us. Let me give you a third one. I'm going I'm to move forward just a little bit because I want to get to number four. Let me give you a third one. Witnesses, what do they do? Witnesses, they don't only are bothered by the loss and engage the loss, but number three, they, they see the folly of the lost. Witnesses see the folly, folly, foolishness. They see the folly of the lost. Let me take a second just to build an argument here. So verse 18, they're, they're, they're conversing, or he's conversing with Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, really smart people, you can go read about them. And look at what they say. What does this babbler wish to say. What do you think that says of their opinion of Paul's words? They like it, they don't like it, or are they impressed or not impressed? They're not that impressed. In fact, the, 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 the meaning of babbler here is like a chicken that plucks up a grain, and spits it out. Plucks up a grain, spits it out. Plucks up a grain, it's nothing new, it's nothing original. That's what these philosophers prided themselves in, in being original, and they're feeling like Paul is just making it up and sharing it, making it up and sharing it. Guys, what am I doing right now? I'm not making anything up. Did I say making it up? I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. He's just grabbing something that's there and throwing it. Grabbing what's there and throwing it. What am I doing right now? I'm taking Acts 17 and I'm picking it up and I'm just throwing it at you guys. I'm a babbler. I'm a babbler, guys. You can say, Jacob, you're a babbler. Wow, you guys, you could have insulted me real bad right there. You could have. You had your chance. There, There is foolishness there because look at verse 18, but then skip down to verse 21. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Somebody created something new, but all of those people, they just told what they've already heard too. So what are they? They're babblers. There's a little bit of folly in that. There's a little bit of foolishness in that. They're, they're, they're kind of insulting him and yet doing the same thing. There's some, there's some folly and foolishness there, but that's not the only one. Let's go over to verse 24. Let's go to verse 24 as we get into Paul's sermon just a little bit here. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Paul is essentially saying here, yo, your gods are too small. If your God can reside in a temple made by your hand, your God is too small. Why would you put your trust in such a small God? My God is big. He's calling out some foolishness there. There's another one. Let me get you another one. Uh, Look at verse 29. Look at verse 29. I got to flip the page. Verse 29, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. If a God is an imagination of man, who is the origin? Man. So who would be the authority? Man. Right, so Paul is even here saying, your gods are foolish and you're foolish because your gods aren't even authoritative in your life. Why are you going to worship and give yourself to something that has no dictating on your life and your eternity? Your your gods are foolish. You are foolish. Let me give you one more. Let's go back to 23. Go back to uh, verse 23. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, something that could be held in your hand. That's what you want to put your hope in, an object of worship, something you can pick up and carry. That's what your hope is in. Something I could pick up and carry and throw into the bottom of that waterfront, you'll never get back. That's what your hope is in. Something so fleeting, an object. Paul is saying, guys, you are, Athenians, you are foolish. You are placing your hope in things that will not last. And then Paul, he's gonna change the, he's gonna change the tide a little bit. Look at, let's look at point number four, and I'm gonna camp out here. Witnesses, what do they do? Witnesses cherish the gospel exclamation point. Witnesses cherish the gospel. Cherish. What do I mean by cherish? To hold dear, to love, to care an immense amount about. You guys have uh, probably seen my daughter Ruthie walking around today or this week at camp. Ruthie is by far the the cutest little thing out there. She is in full camp mode. She's got like tattoo stickers. She's got bracelets and necklaces. She's got beads in her hair. Which one of you girls did that? I don't know. Ruthie's in full camp. I cherish that little girl. What does it look like when I cherish her? I talk about her a whole bunch. I get cuddles when I want. I kiss her. I love her. I even sing with her and to her. Just for the record, I sing three songs with my daughter about my daughter 
Always Be My Baby by Mariah Carey, Enchanted by Taylor Swift, and Mamacita by Family Force Five. Three great songs to sing and dance with your little girl. I cherish that little girl. Guys, if we're going to be witnesses, if we're going to be able to do verse points one through three, then we need to have number four. Students, we need to cherish the gospel above everything else. That's why we can put an exclamation point, exclamation point on it, because it is that good. What I want to do right now is I want to walk through, I want to walk through Paul's sermon. And you know how I said babblers, they, they don't say anything new, they just kind of take what's there and throw it away? I want to see if you can pick up on a trend, okay? Let's work through this together. I'm going to call out some things about, uh, just, just, just some things about God at first. Look at verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it. God is a creating God. Being the Lord of heaven and earth. God is Lord of all. He does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything in it. Guys, he does not need to be served by us. He does not need us for life. He does not depend on us. God is independent. To give you a bigger word, there is an aseity of God, of God, the aseity of God, A-S-E-I-T-Y. God is other. He is different. He is independent, different from us, does not need us. He is God. There is no beginning to him. He is God, aseity of God. Also in that verse, you see that God is a life-giving God. God is a life giver. Look at verse 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Look at this. Having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling. God is a sovereign God in control of all things. That might be Pastor Clint's like favorite word when it comes to theology. He probably said it 347 times in the past two nights. I'm going to say it one more in case you haven't learned it. God is sovereign. He's in control of all things. He has determined a lot of periods and the boundaries. He tells the tides when to stop. He tells the stars when to shine. He tells the sun how to go around the earth. God has determined all of these things. He is in control. He is sovereign. So students, when you, when you feel like life is out of control, turn to the sovereignty of God. God is Paul's first piece of the message. Things are going to change. Things are going to change here. He's talking about the men. Look at verse, he's talking about just mankind. Look at verse 27. That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Why would they need to seek God? Why does man, why do we need to seek God? Because we're not with him. Because your sin, my sin has separated us from God's goodness. Just like Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they were kicked out of the garden oasis. We too, when we sinned, have been kicked and removed from God's presence. You have to seek for him because you, you are a sinner and you, and you have been removed from him. You won't find him though. That's, that's actually kind of the point of this, and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. It, it's almost like mocking them. It, it's almost mocking people who think that they can just find their way to God. Perhaps. It's kind of like if one of you guys, hey, Jacob, hey, Jacob, hey, Jacob, can, 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 can we, can we, uh, can we do a front flip off the high jump tower? I don't know what the lifeguards say. No? Well, perhaps maybe I'll pray about it. I just want you to know that the answer is no. Lifeguard said so. Lifeguard said so. Right? So the, even he's kind of mocking here that you would seek God and perhaps find him. You're not going to. Your sin will, you will never outdo all of your sin in order to find God. You will never outwork all of your unrighteousness with works of righteousness to earn God. In fact, God even says that our works of righteousness are filthy rags. Go get a commentary, read what people say, those filthy rags are really talking about. It's gross. It's a lot worse than even a baby's diaper. But look at, look at the end of verse 27. Look at the end of verse 27. He's talked about God. He's talked about man. You might see where I'm going. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Students, God is not far from you. He is right there beside you. How do I know this? Because he has sent his son to come down to you. Matthew 1 tells that Jesus is what? God with us. John 1 tells us what? That Jesus came in flesh to dwell among us. Hebrews 4 tells us what? That the Jesus, the son of God, has passed through the heavens to come down to you to be your great high priest. Students, God is not far from you. He knows every little thing that you do. He knows every little thing that you say, every little thing that you think. He, he knows the worst version of you that nobody else does. 
And that's the you he sent Jesus for. That's the you that Jesus came to save, to come and be with. And what is the guarantee of this? As Jesus ascends into heaven, what did he send us? And that is right there at the beginning of Acts. You will receive power when what? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Guys, God is right there with you. It's day three. My voice is going away. Sorry. God is not far. He has come to you. So what? So what, Jacob? Well, then let's look at, let's look at verse 30 and 31. Let's look at the, let's look at the big kid verses. You ready? Goodness, I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. <clears throat> verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. The times of ignorance God has overlooked. Students, Paul would say it like this in Romans 2, that his kindness and forbearance, that God was being kind to you, allowing you to sin. God was being kind to you, not bringing judgment when you first deserved it. God was being kind to you in his forbearance. Why? So that it might lead you to repentance. God is gracious to not bring judgment so that you would have the opportunity to repent and turn your life from sin and turn to Christ. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. You guys know that you, you guys are in church enough to know that the word repent really means to turn away from, to say, I'm done with sin, I'm done with those passions, I'm done with those people, and I'm going to turn my life to Christ in faith. Jesus is better than what the world has to offer. That's what I want. I'm done with this to repent. Verse 31. Because why, why? Why does God want us to repent? Verse 31, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, ah, let's pause there. Let's pause there. Let's just read that first part again. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man. Who do you think that man is? Jesus, the only righteous man. He will judge a man by a man of whom he, wow, guys, I'm sorry. He has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. He is going to judge you by Jesus. You could say it like this. Jesus versus you. Who's the righteous one? Winner goes to heaven, loser goes to hell. That is what's taking place in this verse. That's why this is a big boy verse. Because the truth of the matter is, I don't stand up to Jesus. I got no hope. When I read the Gospels, I, I got no hope. I didn't expect a tear up here. Goodness I got no hope, my record versus Jesus's. Just today, I, I was sharing with a student of just my past life when I was a high schooler and the, the dumb things that I partook in, felt, did, chased. I got no hope in one day's actions alone against the record of Jesus. And I'm gonna be judged for it. And yet, and, and here's why I cry, because Jesus is really this good. Because Jesus in the courtroom says, God, don't judge him, judge me. I'll take his sentence. I'll die his death. And in fact, now it's no longer that I'm, I'm just, it's not like I was guilty, but now I'm considered not guilty and I get to go free. In fact, it's even better than that, that I'm, I'm wiped away from my sin because Jesus will take it. And now I get the gift of righteousness. And God says, you're not just innocent, not guilty. In fact, I have every single record of you doing everything perfect in your life. Every wrong that I did, Jesus has made it right. Every sin that I've committed, Jesus has given me his holiness. Every imperfection in my heart, Jesus has given me something abundantly better. Jesus versus you, heaven or hell, and Jesus takes death for you. Now, I, I say it that way. I don't say heaven versus hell, you get heaven and Jesus gets hell, because that's not, that's not the case. That's not the case. Look at the end here. Of this, he has given assurance Student, you want confidence? You want confidence in Christianity? He has given confidence to all by raising him from the dead. The father loves the son so immensely much. Immensely much. <laughs> the father loves the son so much that he accepted his sacrifice of righteousness and raised him back to life. This is the hope that we can have. Until I see a body in a tomb that is Jesus of Nazareth, I can have hope because there is a king who's on the throne next to God awaiting the day that I die so that he can step in my place and secure my salvation once and for all. 
That can be the same for you too. Repent. That is the command today, is to repent and place your faith in the Lord Jesus. It's you or him, and he wants it to be him. He wants to be the one to take the sentence of sin. Look at verse 32. I didn't read it earlier, but this is a very appropriate way for us to respond. Look at verse 32. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, three responses. Here's the first one. Some mocked. Bruh, you lying. Bruh, you ridiculous. Some mocked. But others said, here's number two, we will hear you again about this. Why? Because verse 21, they're all a bunch of babblers. They don't, this is not the proper response. We're going to hear you again about this. That's like saying, oh, I'll, I'll be a Christian when I have kids one day and I'll get my kids back to church. I'll take this God stuff seriously when I go to college and I deal with real world struggles. I'll take this stuff seriously when I have a wife to care for or a husband to love. Right? No, that's not the proper response either. There is one response. Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed. Students, there is one response that will save you. Belief in the Lord Jesus to take your spot and repentance from your sin. And, and, and I want to say this. I, I'm going to use something here. Look at this. Uh, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman. Ladies, give a what, what? And a woman named Damaris and others with them. Guys, the gospel is for all people. It's for men and women. You, you, might, you might come to Hickory Grove students, and if you were like me, I went to Butler High School, I went to Mint Hill Middle School. A lot of times I didn't feel like I fit in with this student ministry because I wasn't a Christian school tid, kid, kid. I wasn't a Christian school kid. I felt like I didn't fit in. The gospel is for you if you don't feel like you fit in. I don't have white skin like you, Jacob. The gospel is for you with your black skin, with your brown skin, with your yellow skin, with your orange skin, purple skin, green skin, when you're sick and your belly hurts. Right? The, the gospel is for you. Jacob, I don't have the good godly parents. Jacob, Jacob, I don't have people that are pushing me to Christianity. Hey, student, first off, that's why you have the church, so that you can have brothers and sisters and older men and women that are here with you right now who can be your spiritual fathers, who can be your spiritual mothers. And guess what? The gospel is for you too. Guys, there is no barrier of salvation except your sin. And so I'm asking you tonight to repent of your sin and turn to faith in the Lord Jesus. Let me pray for you students, and then we will sing three more songs. And as we sing, so go ahead and pray. Go ahead and, go ahead and bow your head. Just take a moment. Let's, let's, let's just consider a couple things together. If we think of those first three points, you call yourself a Christian, there's fruit in your life, you love the gospel, you believe in Jesus, are you bothered by the lostness around you? Are you bothered by the lostness inside you? Maybe you are. Maybe you, like me, gosh, man, when I see people who, people who don't love Jesus, who I just feel like have missed it, I get bothered and I cry. That's okay. You can make fun of me. Are you bothered by the loss? But if you are, are you engaging with the loss? Is your mouth open and words coming out that preach the goodness of Jesus? Number three, are you seeing the folly around you and you are giving yourself to the word for truth? Four, are you cherishing the gospel? Do you love the Lord? Are you thankful, deeply thankful for what Jesus has done? What, what, if, what if Paul was here today? What do you say, students of Hickory Grove? I see that you are very hopeful people. In fact, I walk through your basement. I walk through your loft and I see that your hope is in entertainment, that it'll give you a better life. Your hope is in stuff, that your iPhone will make you more happy. That your hope is in people. That your hope is in an acceptance and approval. But you are missing it. That there is a God who will satisfy every longing of your heart. God who will provide everything that you need and more. God who in Christ Jesus will accept you fully, even as sinful as you are. Students, I hope you place your faith in Jesus. And tonight, I, I hope you talk to your leader during debrief time or after about starting a, a, a relationship with Jesus and following him. Let's pray. Father, as much as I love these students, you love them much more than I do. And God, I pray that you are honored in the preaching, that you are honored in the singing, and that you are honored in our hearts 
that we would love you, that we would give our life to you, that we would turn from sin and believe in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.
my firm foundation The rock on which I stand Everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause His name Faithful through generations.
When I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb Until I met you Well, I was breathing, but not alive. In all my failures, I tried to hide. It was my tomb until I met you. Come on. You called my name.
shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a sinner. Let's repeat that one more time. I need a rescue. My sin was heavy. 